thank you for the work that you do day in, day out. Uh, it, it's nice, I remember when I was a community organizer, uh, and as Jim said, I, I was with a church-based group on the south side of Chicago. And, you know, one of the difficulties sometimes was a sense of isolation in terms of the work that you were doing on a day in, day out basis, because it's hard. And so having this opportunity to gather together in fellowship and to see that uh, you are not alone uh, in the work that you do and the faith that you express, I think, is absolutely wonderful. So thank you for the work that you do. You know, uh, I have had the opportunity to take a look at this covenant for a new America. And it is filled with outstanding policies and prescriptions for much of what ails this country. So I'd like to congratulate uh, Jim and Sojourners and uh, the call to renewal for putting this together and, to, and for putting the fire under the feet of the political leadership here in Washington. But you know, today I'm going to talk about the connection between religion and politics and perhaps offer some thoughts about how we can sort through some of the often bitter arguments that we've been seeing over the last several years. I, I do so because, as all of you know, we can affirm the importance of poverty in the Bible. And we can raise up this covenant. We can pass it out. We can talk to the press. We can discuss the religious call uh, for us not only to tend to issues like poverty, but also to tend to the broader issues of social justice and environmental stewardship. We can affirm all these important issues, but it won't have an impact unless we tackle head on the mutual suspicion that sometimes exists between religious America and secular America. And I want to give you an example that I think illustrated this fact for me. Some of you know that uh, during the 2004 U.S. Senate election, in the general election, I ran against uh, a gentleman named Alan Keyes. And my opponent, uh, Alan Keyes, was well versed in the Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson style of rhetoric gets a little heated sometimes, uh, a rhetoric that sometimes labels progressives as both immoral and godless. And in fact, towards the end of the campaign, Mr. Keyes uh, announced to the people of Illinois that, quote, Jesus Christ would not vote for Barack Obama. Jesus Christ would not vote for Barack Obama. Christ would not vote for Barack Obama because Barack Obama has behaved in a way that is inconceivable for Christ to have behaved. Jesus Christ would not vote for Barack Obama. Now, I was urged by some of my liberal supporters to take this, uh, not to take this statement seriously, to essentially ignore it. To them, Mr. Keyes was an extremist, and his arguments were not worth entertaining. And since at the time I was up 40 points in the polls, uh, it probably wasn't uh, a bad piece of strategic advice. But what they didn't understand uh, was that I had to take Mr. Keyes seriously, for he claimed to speak on behalf of my religion and my God. He claimed to know certain truths. Obama says he's a Christian, he was saying, and yet he supports a lifestyle that the Bible calls an abomination. Mr. Obama says he's a Christian, but he supports the destruction of innocent and sacred life. So Mr. Keyes would say. 
And what would my supporters have me say? How might I respond? Should I say that a, a literalist reading of the Bible was folly? Should I say that Mr. Keyes, who is a Roman Catholic, should ignore the teachings of the Pope? Unwilling to go there, I answered with what has come to be the typical liberal response in such debates. Namely, I said that we live in a pluralistic society, that I can't impose my own religious views on another. I informed Mr. Keyes that I was running to be the United States Senator of Illinois and not the Minister of Illinois. But, but Mr. Keyes' implicit accusation that I was not a true Christian nagged at me. And I was also aware that my answer did not adequately address the role that my faith has in guiding my own values and my own beliefs. And my dilemma is by no means unique. In a way, it reflects the broader debate that we've been having in this country for the last 30 years over the role of religion in politics. For some time now, there's been plenty of talk among pundits and pollsters that the political divide in this country has fallen sharply along religious lines. In fact, the single biggest gap in party affiliation among white Americans today is not between men and women, or those who reside in so-called red states and those who reside in blue, but between those who attend church regularly and those who don't. Conservative leaders have been all too happy to exploit this gap, consistently reminding evangelical Christians that Democrats disrespect their values and dislike their church, while suggesting to the rest of the country that religious Americans care only about the issues of abortion and gay marriage, school prayer, and intelligent design. And Democrats, for the most part, have taken the bait. At times, at best, we may try to avoid the conversation about religion altogether, fearful of offending anyone and claiming that regardless of our personal beliefs, constitutional principles tie our hands. At worst, uh, there are some who dismiss religion in the public square as inherently irrational or intolerant, insisting on a caricature of religious Americans that paint them as fanatical, or thinking that the very word Christian describes one's political opponents, not a people of faith. Now, such strategies for avoidance of the issue may work for progressives when our opponent is Alan Keyes. But over the long haul, I think we make a mistake when we fail to acknowledge the power of faith in people's lives, in the lives of the American people. I think it's time that we join a serious debate about how to reconcile faith with our modern pluralistic society. But over the long haul, I think we make a mistake when we fail to acknowledge the power of faith in people's lives, in the lives of the American people. I think it's time that we join a serious debate about how to reconcile faith with our modern pluralistic society. And if we're going to do that, then we first need to understand that Americans are religious people. Ninety percent of us believe in God. Seventy percent affiliate themselves with an organized religion. Thirty-eight percent call themselves committed Christians. Substantially more people in America believe in angels than they do in evolution. This, tenant, this religious tendency is not simply the result of successful marketing by skilled preachers or the draw of popular megachurches. In fact, it speaks to a hunger that's deeper than that, a hunger that goes beyond any particular issue or cause. Each day, it seems, 
that thousands of Americans who are going about their daily round, they're dropping off their kids, they're driving to the office, they're flying to a business meeting, they're shopping at the mall, they're trying to stay on their diets, and they're coming to the realization that something's missing. They're deciding that their work, their possessions, their diversions, their sheer busyness is not enough. They want a sense of purpose, a narrative arc to their lives. They're looking to relieve a chronic loneliness, a feeling supported by a recent study that shows that Americans have fewer close friends and confidants than ever before. And so they need an assurance that somebody out there cares about them, is listening to them, that they are not just destined to travel down that long highway towards nothingness. And I speak with some experience on this matter. You know, I was not raised in a particularly religious household, as undoubtedly many in the audience were. My father, who returned to Kenya when I was just two, uh, was born a Muslim, but as an adult uh, was an atheist. My mother, whose parents were non-practicing Baptists and Methodists, uh, was probably one of the most spiritual people I knew, one of the kindest, best people I have ever known. But she grew up with a healthy skepticism of organized religion herself, partly because of the hypocrisy that she had seen in the church early in her life. And because she grew up with a healthy skepticism of organized religion, so did I. So it wasn't until after college, when I went to Chicago to work as a community organizer, that I confronted my own spiritual dilemma. I was working with churches, and the Christians who I was working with, they recognized themselves in me. They saw that I knew their book, that I shared their values, that I sang their songs. But they sensed that a part of me remained detached and removed, that I was an observer in their midst. And in time, I came to realize that something was missing for me as well, that without a vessel for my beliefs, without a commitment to a particular community of faith, at some level, I would always remain apart and alone. And if it weren't for the particular attributes of the historically black church, I might have accepted this faith. But as the months passed in Chicago, I found myself drawn not just to work with the church, but be in the church. And for one thing, uh, I believed and still believe in the power of the African-American religious tradition to spur social change, a power made real by some of the leaders uh, who are here today. Because of its past, the black church understands in an intimate way the biblical call to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked, to challenge powers and principalities. And in its historical struggle for freedom and the rights of man, I was able to see faith as more than just a comfort to the weary or a hedge against death, but rather as an active, palpable agent in the world as a source of hope. And perhaps it was out of this intimate knowledge of hardship, grounding faith in struggle, that the church offered me a second insight, one that I think is important to emphasize today, that faith doesn't mean that you don't have doubts. You know, you come to church precisely because you are of this world, not apart from it. You need to embrace Christ precisely because you have sins to wash away because you're human and need an ally in this difficult journey. And it was because of these newfound understandings that I was finally able to walk down the aisle of Trinity United Church of Christ on 95th Street in the south side of Chicago one day and affirm my faith 
And it came about 